Digital board games are fortunate to ride on the shoulders of giants. Their source material often has thousands of fans, millions of hours of gameplay, robust rule sets, well-developed uh, art styles, all before a digital version has even been conceived. Um, but despite these advantages, bringing a beloved board game to the digital realm has its share of challenges. Uh, players are gonna demand features like asynchronous gameplay and robust AI opponents. These are features that might not have been considered in the original board game design. Features like tactility and table talk are difficult, if not impossible, to reproduce online. But digital adaptations can offer some unique features of their own. So things like real-time uh, bookkeeping, embedded rules references, and contextual prompts. These are some of the tricks from the Temple Gates games toolbox in digitizing some of our favorite board games like Race for the Galaxy, Roll for the Galaxy, and Ascension, and hopefully some of these will apply to your games that you're working on. Just to give a little bit of context, this is Race for the Galaxy. Um, it's an engine building card game set in space where players are playing cards to uh, place developments, uh, settle worlds. Oh, I do it with my water. And build the most prosperous empire. This game was designed by Tom Lehman, um, who is in the back there. He's pretty cool and published by Rio Grande, uh, and it's since sold about a million copies or more around the world. And my team has been responsible for digitizing this for uh, PC, tablet, and mobile. So three things you're gonna think about when you're digitizing board games. Source, quality, and delivery. Your source, what is the game that you're gonna be choosing? Quality, what are the features that are gonna go into that game? And delivery, how are you gonna deliver those features? So for source, how are you choosing the game? Um, realistically, this is gonna be based on licensing rights. Um, but that being said, what's um, fun in an analog board game is gonna be really different from what's fun in a digital board game. So not all games are gonna translate well. It's gonna be a subset of board games that are out there that are still gonna be fun on your phone. So things like having one player feel like the expert for 15 minutes as they're explaining the game to their friends, um, that's not really practical online. Most of your online players are already gonna know how to play the game, or they're gonna just jump into a tutorial um, when they pick up the game on the App Store. Um, <clears throat> also, tactility. So those gorgeous glassy gems or pewter tokens that you're rolling around in your fingers between turns, uh, those are not available online, um, and those are really fun. Um, you're not gonna be able to be upgrading your components like with things like a broken token. Uh, or painting minis online. So you wanna choose a game that's not wholly reliant on these physical game features. Um, a game like Super Fight, in which you have players arguing back and forth about who would win in an imaginary battle between characters, that's really reliant on table talk. And ironically, table talk is a feature that mobile board games are not really great at, um, which is surprising, because phones are used for talking, but players don't necessarily wanna be chatting with each other on a mobile game. Um, it's expensive to moderate, and um, players are not expecting the chat. Or a game like Mancala. This is a game where you're gonna be reaching into the cubbies and distributing tokens around a board. And that feels really good, but if you have no tactility, because um, you're missing that, is there enough still left to make a digital board game out of it? And you wanna lean into a game that's gonna really rely on the features that are fun in a digital space. So things like AI, things like asynchronous gameplay. So Race for the Galaxy is a tableau builder, which means you're playing a bunch of cards in succession as permanent cards. Those cards have a lot of information on them, and that means that the AI can look at that information and make meaningful predictions based on that information um, with high degrees of surety. And so that's a game that really works well with an AI. That's in contrast to something like a deck builder, like another game I've worked on, Ascension, um, because in the deck builder, a lot of that information is gonna be hidden away in a player's hand, or it's gonna be random through the deck. So you might have performance issues with your AI trying to make predictions there. So choosing a game that takes advantage of these features takes advantage of things like asynchronous. Um, so your players, so asynchronous gameplay can be kind of uh, controversial. Some people think that board games are meant to be played at a table with people in real time. And I think there's a lot of value to playing that way. 
But realistically, if you're digitizing a board game, many of your players are gonna to wanna to play asynchronously. If they're stacking up games five or 10 games deep, uh, you wanna make sure that those games do not feel repetitive to the player. So one way you can avoid that re repetition is choosing a game that has really different end game states. So in Race for the Galaxy, you might have a rush military state at the end of the game and that's how you win. Or you might build up uh, a production engine and there's a lot of different kinds of strategies towards winning. If you're gonna have a different end game state, it probably means that on your way to getting there it was different as well. So the path is gonna be variant as well. So race sometimes feels like a complex game, but in actuality, you're not making a lot of different decisions at once. It's more of a stream of isolated decisions as you play, and it doesn't matter if you haven't played the game or if you're not familiar with it, but it's just a stream of isolated decisions um, because the game is broken up into phases. So you're making a choice, then you're executing it, then you make another choice, then you execute, then you make another choice. And what that looks like in the game is, let's say the player's choosing an action, they can choose explore, develop, settle, consume, trade, or produce, they, they, they chose develop. They choose develop, then execute, then they choose what card are they gonna develop, then execute, then they choose how are they going to pay for that development, what cards are they discarding, and then they execute. Because of that path, that stream of decisions, you can add a prompt into your game. The prompt is gonna tell them during the execution what they're supposed to be doing. And this is really good for digital board games for a couple of reasons. One, it reduces analysis paralysis. Um, but two, it's really great for those asynchronous players who have stacked up a lot of games at the same time so they can come back and see what they were trying to do. It just softens that re-entry for them. This is in contrast to a game like Command and Conquer. Now, it's not a board game, but it has a really different sort of uh, path to play. In Command & Conquer, you can open up the build menu and you might have hundreds of choices of what building you're gonna make. Um, and, and that's not really necessarily related to the next choice that you make in the game. So there isn't this stream of choices, and so it might be more difficult for a game like that to offer a prompt that tells the player what to do next um, because it's not necessarily clear what they're trying to do next. So that's a little bit on how to choose a game um, that you're gonna digitize. Uh, quality, what, what are the features that you want to implement in your digital version? There's a lot of really neat features that you can get away with digitally that you can't in an analog game. Um, <clears throat> one thing I see players who play board games, um, one thing I see them do over and over, and I do this myself too, is um, they don't take advantage fully of the abilities that they've accrued throughout the game. A lot of times this happens to new players because there's a lot of information. It's a lot to juggle, and you might forget something. Um, so if you have a card like Interstellar Bank in Race for the Galaxy in play in your tableau, this means anytime any player has activated the second phase, you're gonna get to draw a card. Now, players might forget this if they're playing around the kitchen table with their friends, but digitally, you can just draw the card for them. Um, or you have a choice as a developer if you want to, if you, um, once you can prompt them to draw the card. So you're gonna make that decision because you're gonna to wanna to have a balance between how much you're automating for the players and how much you're letting them do themselves. But either way you solve it, your players are gonna have confidence that they're not gonna accidentally screw themselves out of a win because they've accidentally made an illegal um, omission of following the rules. Another thing I see happening over and over with people is that they they just learn the rules of the game wrong. So board games are often taught by a player to another player who might teach their friends, who might teach their friends. And because of that oral tradition in learning the game, little mutations in the rules can sneak in. And I can't tell you how many emails I get about bugs in Race for the Galaxy where it just turns out that people have been playing the game wrong for years and they didn't realize it. <laughs> but you know, those emails are really helpful because they can help you identify pain points. Um, so in Race for the Galaxy, this one in particular came up a bunch where players were confused on why they couldn't play a particular card. Now the rules of the game state that if you already have a card in your tableau, you can't play an identical copy of it. Um, but by paying attention to where people were confused, I was able to patch in this treatment, which is a little bit of a dimming out, and that just manages expectations. Players see it's dimmed out when they try to drag it into play, it doesn't work, but they can see there's a reason it didn't work, it was, it was dim. And there is kind of a, a bonus feature in this, in that when players are trying to figure out what are they gonna discard, 
and they can just easily discard any dimmed cards. They don't even have to read them. They know these are not gonna be uh, legal cards to play in the future. So what other features should you be implementing in your digital board games? You don't have to be creative. <laughs> your players are gonna tell you exactly what they want. Um, so David Newman on statelyplay.com posted this multiplayer manifesto. It details about 20 different features that are seen as baseline mandatory to include in any multiplayer uh, board game. These are things like ELO, log, server status, timers, notifications, etc. So we hadn't planned to implement all of these features when we first um, rolled out our Race for the Galaxy schedule, uh, but we posted the beta to BoardGameGeek.com and the resounding response from the community was that they wanted more of these multiplayer features. So we ended up spending about four more months uh, developing these and it was over half of our development time on these features. If you're following this manifesto and you're implementing features like asynchronous gameplay, um, you're gonna have players who are stacking up those games at once and you wanna support players being able to seamlessly glide from one game to the next so they can uh, enter a game, take their turn, they're waiting for their multiplayer opponent to take a turn, just hit a next game button to take the next tur turn, wait, next game, etc. And a question came up, what do you do when a player has no more multiplayer games queued up. Um, there's a couple things you could do as a developer. Oh, shoot, I should plug in my battery. Um, <laughs> there's a, a couple things that you should do as a developer. Um, you can, um, uh, just, hopefully it's fine. Um, you can um, either prompt them to create a new multiplayer game, and, um, and that's great because you are gonna to wanna to populate your multiplayer lobby with lots of games for lots of players to join into. Um, but there's actually kind of a, like a cap on the capacity of games your players are willing to play at once. There's a sweet spot somewhere between five and 10 games. They don't really wanna be juggling more strategies. Um, it's a little much. So you can pop them into an AI game. And you know, at first I thought about, well, do I wanna open up a configuration screen where they can choose what expansion to play or um, how many players they want to play against. But I ended up just implementing um, a very like seamless, popping them into a game that uses the, the last configuration of a game that they played. So it sort of just glides them into something, they don't have to think about it, and that will just let them take turns while they're waiting for their next multiplayer opponent. And I thought that worked out okay. So what are you gonna do with the, uh, all these different stacks of multiplayer games that are accruing. Are you gonna display those to your players? Are you gonna put them in the lobby? At first I thought, no, I, I don't think so because that's just gonna be spam. Um, it's gonna be a lot of information. People can't necessarily engage with a game that's already in progress. Um, but I've since changed my mind um, because what happens is if you're if your uh, matchmaking code is doing a good job at sweeping players quickly into a game, then the games fill up really quickly and you don't have a lot of games there. So if you had a new player who just steps into the lobby, there might not look like there's a lot of games going on. Um, and so you're broadcasting an artificially low level of activity to your player community. So since then, I've started adding more of the multiplayer games into your player lobby. And I see this kind of stuff everywhere now. I see it in magic matchmaking. I see it in server lists. I see these games. You, have absolutely zero functionality. You can't join them as a, a, a spectator, you can't join them as a player, but it broadcasts an activity level that encourages your community, it feels more vibrant, and I recommend doing it. So after implementing all these features from the multiplayer manifesto, at least half of our code has been dedicated to things like um, friends list, uh, storing asynchronous game data, ELO. Um, did it work out? Was it a good idea? At launch, only 5% of our players were engaging with multiplayer. So we had ended up spending about half of our development time on something that only a very, very small minority of people were actually using. And that was a pretty big bummer. Um, eventually that number has grown to 25% and it's still growing. Um, I definitely do recommend investing in these features because even though this is a, a vocal minority, they're going to be, these players are gonna be the ones who are driving your community forward. They're gonna be the ones who are posting tournaments, they're gonna to be the ones who are posting YouTube videos and uh, moderating your forums and posting um, a lot of stuff that's gonna encourage your community to thrive. 
That being said, if 95% of your players are playing in, uh, in AI games at launch, you didn't need to have a really robust AI to encourage that replayability of the game. Um, this is something we do with temporal difference learning. Our AI is driven by a neural network. If you're interested in more about that, I'm gonna chat a little bit more at 4.40 today um, about that. But if either way, I definitely encourage you to check out keldon.net slash RFTG. This is the um, open source uh, neural network AI that we used in Race for the Galaxy. And if you're working on a digital board game, it's something that you can look at the code and see if this is something that's right for your game. All right, and finally, delivery. So how best to deliver some of these features I've been talking about? Um, first, I'll talk a little bit about animation. Or you have a trade-off between speed and legibility in your games. And you have to figure out how fast you're gonna animate everything. If a lot of your players are playing against AI opponents, um, how fast are you gonna show those AI opponent moves? Um, and what are you gonna show? If we paused by the onesies and showed every single victory point shit or every single card that was acquired by a player, it would be really monotonous. And actually a lot of board game apps do this. I mean, we started this way. We had a script that executed and we would just um, show every little thing flying across the screen one at a time. That, and then I asked myself to dig a little deeper. What are we trying to communicate with these animations? Um, if you think about sitting around a kitchen table playing board games with your friends, there's animations there, right? You see um, when the, the cards are dealt out to each player. That's the initialization of the game. Or you see maybe when the deck is depleted and you have to reshuffle it. And maybe that's like the halfway point of the game and that, that's a signal to your players of a, a state change in the game. So. Race for the Galaxy has simultaneous turns if you've played. Um, you know that every player is doing their turns at once. And as a UI designer, it kind of feels like this. It's this like sort of crazy intersection where victory points and cards are flying all around. And trying to make that clear what's going on to your players has been a challenge. Um, so we came, we came up with a system of locking attention tokens. And what this really does is it helps us triage the events in the game to focus on vignettes, to focus on the moments that really matter to the player. So if you have something that is a really important moment, let's say the AI is gonna take over one of my worlds. That's a really big moment, I want the player to pay attention to that. That event grabs the main attention token and locks it. And no other event that would grab that main attention token can proceed, they get queued up behind it until that event is finished animating and then the next things can go forward. At the same time, there are a system of uh, lesser uh, attention tokens um, things for things like the draw deck and the victory point pool. And, um, and these can, can proceed forward without detracting from the main vignette that you're showing. So you can see here, um, as the cards are drawn into the player's tableau, nothing else major is happening at that one moment. Um, but even when you're doing this triage, if you do a system of locking attention tokens like we've done, you have to figure out how fast you're going to animate things. Um, a lot of people uh, working on digital board games have a video game background. I worked on Spore, SimCity, and The Sims, and um, I think that's probably pretty common. Um, and we know as video game developers how to make pretty animations and 3D characters and clever dialogue. Um, but for board games, a lot of that stuff really gets kind of in the way. Your players that are stacking up their asynchronous games are just gonna wanna make decisions and, and get that rapid decision making and, and build their mastery of the game. Um, so they're not necessarily gonna want to have a cinematic moment or have a like, character pop up and chat with them. Um, so as a result, you're gonna wanna offer a slider, even still with a triage, to make your animations go really fast. Now with the slider to make your animations go fast, you have to determine what animations are affected. So traditionally with video games, there's two animation speeds. There are things that happen at game speed and there are like the dragon flying across the screen that can be really slow, it can be really monumental. Um, and then you're gonna have UI speed and that's really lickety split. You want that to feel fast and immediate for the user. Um, but with board games, how do you make that distinction? Everything in a board game is basically UI. Um, and you really wanna focus on what is reacting to a player. Is a player clicking a card? You know, is a player uh, examining something? Those animations need to be exempt from your slider. If your slider is set to slow because the player is gonna learn a lot of what's going on, um, they, they want that slow animation teaching them, you still wanna have some lickety split reactive uh, animations. So visually, um, 
Board games can be really laden with symbols and iconography, race is no exception. Um, and typically, if a player doesn't understand what a particular symbol means, they're gonna consult the rules um, or they're gonna ask a friend. But in digital land, you can embed the rules right there within the game. So this is what it looks like for Race for the Galaxy. I put the plain text of what is going on with the rules right there and you can expand any card in the game and, and figure out what the symbols are trying to tell you if you don't remember. Now this helper text isn't new. If you remember old Macs, they had the little question mark icon in the corner and um, <clears throat> that could be dragged to anything on the desktop to get a little bit more information. Eventually, this evolved into tooltips, which are really handy, but tooltips cannot necessarily accommodate the volume of text you want to communicate in a board game. So we started adding this just on cards, and then we added it on goals, and eventually we started adding it on the phases as well. Um, we started putting it all over the place. Um, and even though we kept wanting it everywhere, we weren't prepared for how much our players wanted it even more, to the point where um, in the beta, one of the biggest uh, requests that they had was hotkeys or swipes so they could cycle through this information. Because as a developer of a game, you see the game every day, you play it all the time, you know how to play the game, but new, it's easy to forget how much new players are gonna really take advantage of this information. So thinking about something like Magic the Gathering, they have keywords, right? This basilisk has death touch, and on the left you can see this card has an explanation of what that keyword does. Any amount of damage this does deals to a creature is enough to destroy it. Right, on the right, there's a different version of this card, and they didn't explain the keyword. So they have to make this trade-off of whether they're gonna explain it or not. Um, they wanna sprinkle it in enough so that players can remember what the keywords do, but they don't wanna do it too much because they have to reduce the font size to accommodate it. They might not be able to put other abilities on the card because there's not enough room. Um, it just clutters things up a little bit. So in digital land, you never have to make that trade-off. You never have to decide. You can always have the inspection available to your players for board games. And then just as the player masters the board game and doesn't need it, they just never go into the inspection mode. So pretty soon we started wanting this in all board games, all games in general. Like how cool would it be if you're playing League of Legends and you could just double click Zoe and know that she does a bunch of burst damage before having to learn the hard way. Embedding rules references like this really alleviates a lot of the burden on a player doing that big teaching session right up front at the beginning. Usually you're gonna learn a board game for 30 minutes and it can be a little bit of a slog. So with video games, uh, typically a lot of these rules are embedded in wikis that are external to the game. So um, <clears throat> if you're gonna play Minecraft or Kerbal Space Program at the highest levels, you're gonna be accessing wikis. It'd be really cool if some of this information could be accessed right within the game. Now we're able to embed rules references with the cards because we draw all of the cards on the fly. So for any given card in Race for the Galaxy, we're programmatically turning on and off about 50 to 100 different pieces of UI at a time. And the reason, there's a lot of reasons to do this. Here's four of them. Um, if you have a card like Ancient Race, this is a starting world. And it has a starting world condition, you have a little bit thinner of a, a starting hand. Um, but you might draw this card mid-game or late-game, in which case it's not a starting world. We can just programmatically turn off that piece of UI that's related to the start of the game. So you can have a little bit of contextual information on whether you're gonna show UI or not. Also, it's really great for localization. If you're programmatically drawing your cards in your game, you can easily translate them on the fly. Also, um, if your players have different configurations enabled, if they're turning on and off different expansions of your game, or let's say some players really like takeovers in Race for the Galaxy, some players don't, if you turn off takeovers, you can just never show any takeover UI to the players who don't wanna play with them, and it cleans up the game quite a bit. And finally, drawing cards on the fly is gonna save you texture memory, which is actually a really big deal if you're making a board game in mobile because uh, you have a lot of card art, it's gonna hog your texture memory. Any savings you can get with reusing borders or icons is gonna be a big deal. In Race for the Galaxy, we're on our third expansion now. We're already having to start to move to a streaming texture solution because we're basically out of space. So our UI is a little bit insane. Um, this, is the, this is the main UI for the game. And you wanna design your UI so that it can accommodate a very full end game state. 
Um, and we do this by having recursively nested UIs where we populate them into cards into the tables and that can accommodate different aspect ratios, which is the fun of making mobile board games. Um, super fun. Um, and you might say, Teresa, that's crazy. That's a, that's a lot. Why not just not put everything on the screen? Um, these are a couple of my other favorite mobile board games. This is Agricola and Lords of Waterdeep. In Agricola, they have a pagination system. So you can paginate between your farm and your opponent's farm and the worker placement area um, and get your information there. In Lords of Waterdeep, you can scroll around and pan around across the screen. And I love these games, but my problem with both of these solutions is that you're tasking your player to memorize a lot of information so that when they're making a decision, they have to pull it from memory rather than seeing it right on the screen. In Race for the Galaxy, we try to give you as much information as is relevant to your turn immediately available to you visually. And we did that by having this system of abstracts or little summaries of information. So here I have my main tableau in the middle and I have my opponents that I'm playing against. And there's a summary of what um, is going on in their tableau at the top. That summary you can see in the animation, it expands out and you can always inspect it further. So as a designer, you have to decide what are you gonna communicate in this summary version? So for us, we are communicating, you know, the top left card for the AI here costs two. And I'm, I'm showing it's a two cost planet. I just made a decision. I'm not gonna show the victory points. I'm gonna show the cost. But players know there's a correlation between victory points and cost. So hopefully that's enough information for them to make their choices. And this, is a, this design decision is actually originally from Tom and Keldon, um, who made the AI, and we liked it a lot, so we implemented it. And we, we expanded it a little bit more. If you have a, uh, different military powers in the game, we condense them down into an icon that can always be expanded out for more information. Another of my favorite games, Ascension, did a great job of condensing down information by cropping cards. You might ask, what can you get away with when you're cropping a card? You know, can you get away with getting rid of keywords? icons, abilities, you can actually get away with getting rid of all of it, um, as long as you keep artwork. Because the artwork is gonna be the shorthand that your players are gonna memorize that they remember all of those other abilities and keywords and icons from. So, in Race for the Galaxy, we're able to deviate a little bit from the baked card art because we're programmatically drawing our cards on the fly. And that lets us get away with something that's really important, which is real-time bookkeeping. And this is a, a big service you can do for your players. You wanna be judicious on when you're doing it. So in Race for the Galaxy, there are six cost developments, and these give a dynamic scoring victory point value depending on the game state at the end of the game. So this is Galactic Exchange, and on the left you see the version that's in the, in the card game you're gonna play in analog. It has a question mark that represents that dynamic score. And on the right, you see a version that we can do in game. We can, we can just figure out what the score is. We can say, okay, this card gets uh, some points for every different color in play of, of world you have in play. If you have a bunch of those worlds, you have nine points here, for example. And we started by adding this just in the tableau. And eventually, we started putting it in your hand. We found that players really like having this information right up front, even before they've played the card. And if you're gonna ask your player to uh, to do the math and figure out these scores, it usually takes about 30 seconds, and pretty much no one does it. They do about a five second approximation, which is pretty good, but um, occasionally it's way off. So we find by doing the real-time bookkeeping for the players, their, their scores are much higher and they like the feature a lot, so I recommend it. A lot of these features I've been talking about today have been things that are gonna help you get your player comfortable and familiar with the game in a teacherless environment where they don't have table talk, um, but there is a digital platform where you can have table talk, you can have a teacher, and that's in VR. Um, that's uh, one of the reasons that we've brought, uh, we're bringing Race for the Galaxy to VR, and we brought Ascension to VR. Um, you can get table talk, you can get, you know, you can, if someone's new, you can come up right behind them, look at the cards in their hand, help them through what they should be playing um, next, and and just chat about your week while you're playing a board game with people. Like I can, I can play a board game with my sister in South Carolina um, online with her and just hear about her day, which is pretty cool. And we did this with Ascension too. Up next, we're gonna be working on Roll for the Galaxy and maybe I'll be back next year with some ideas about how to make the AI performant for that. That's what we're struggling with right now and also how much to automate for your players. This is a dice version of Race for the Galaxy if you haven't played it. So 
anyway, that's my talk. Come find me if you uh, have any questions about board games or like to digitize board games and play more board games. That's it.